Hi guys, welcome back to yet another instalment on the Make It Happen Summit. So today in part three, we have Franziska van Hungberg. Very inspirational. I found it very interesting and that's why I recorded it. So I hope you enjoy this next video. My name is Kudula. I'm the Europe Director and also responsible for our global growth at Future Females. And I'm super happy to be here now with Franzi. And I know that our German community and all the people watching from Germany will probably know a little bit about you, probably a little more about you actually. But we have people joining from 10 different countries, maybe even more. So maybe do us a favor and do a quick introduction to our community. Sure. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really honored and thrilled to be here today. And um, yeah, it's amazing what you've built within the last three years. Um, it's really incredible, this um, community of a great female, hopefully female founders worldwide. So I'm, I'm really excited for this talk. And uh, my name is uh, Francis van Hanberg. As you just said, I'm an entrepreneur and um, I've uh, built it several companies now and um, so as you might say i'm a serial entrepreneur even if i hate this word but um that's probably how how you have to say it um i've um, i'm living in berlin since 15 years now i'm married i have uh, two daughters and they are uh, three and five and um I've started my career in Berlin. I um, worked here. Um, first of all, I did my, my university here in Berlin and studied communication. And um, then I did my master's in the US and in Hungary, came back to Berlin. Then I started working here. I was um, working for three years for Rocket Internet, a company builder where I worked for Zalando, for example, and two other ventures. And then I had the idea to um, found my first own company, Bloomy Days, um, which was the world's first flower subscription service and um, that was quite successful so we scaled it up um, within five years and then um, accidentally a financing round short term failed because one of our investors um, passed away and uh, we had to sell the company to our largest competitor and then I decided I have to start something new um, and uh, that's what I did. So uh, now I'm doing jewelry and um, the company is called the Sisplis. Um, before it was called Holy Godia. I think we will probably talk a little bit more about that in, in a second. Um, and I really love it. And the, the large, I can uh, already say the large advantage to flowers is that now we're building products that last for a lifetime and not only for one week. So I'm really happy to be here. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> Sometimes you want to ask more questions to get people to tell more, but you did already cover a lot of points. Um, and for the ones of you that where Francie is quite new to you and all of the others, so the first one, as you said, or the first one after your already experience in startups, was Bloomy Days, um, the first subscription service for flowers. So I know this is now seemed to like far, far long gone, but um, it's obviously interesting for all the people to know where the starting point of an entrepreneurial journey could be. So also taking you back now to, I think it was in 2012, um, when you did start your first company. What Absolutely. Was, how did you get this idea? So I think, first of all, it's important to understand that I always had this enormous um, pressure in me to build my own company. So um, when I was four years old, I um, was with my parents and my siblings on vacation and I selected mussels on the beach. And um, while I was doing this, I asked my mom to get me some, um, some, uh, paint paint brushes so um the whole night i was uh, sitting there painting the muscles and the next day i came to the beach and i was selling those muscles for like five pennies and it was really it's an, a really nice story but a four-year-old who's doing this i think it was always in myself i always needed to live this entrepreneurship to to build a company i always had such a strong feeling that i have to do it but um, then I decided really when I was 12, and I, I remember that point that I'm uh, going to build a company. So <laughs> it was really, um, really young at my age, which is not so often. 
So I decided, first of all, to study something that is really short because I wanted to have the university just as a backup. So if I need to go back to corporate, then I have something in my pocket, but uh, not really for um, what, um, yeah, what, I, what I was looking uh, to do for. And um, then I, and that's probably something a lot of others can relate to. I had this moment where a lot of people told me, you have to be self-employed, you have to build your company, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I always had the feeling I'm not ready. And for me, it was really the goal to have five years of working experience before I jump. Because I said, then if something happens and it, failure is so easy, and, and I mean, nine out of 10 startups are going to fail, so I wanted to have something I can lean back on if something is not working out as it will work out. So I had this five years of working experience. I gained a lot of experience at Rocket Internet. I changed like the company every year where my husband, not, not, uh, he was not my husband uh, <laughs> so long ago, but um, at that point, uh, my boyfriend, he, he said, you cannot uh, really screw your CV. You really have to have a look at your CV because when you're changing the company so often, it's not really good for your career. And I was like, you know what? My goal in life is to never be employed again. So I only want to gain experience. I really want to understand how it works. I want to see different stages of companies. I want to see different hiring processes. I want to see different leadership um, management skills. And so that was was really the perfect way for me and then at this moment there was like kind of it was on the edge I had the feeling okay now I'm ready and then there was the idea and then I did it so um that's that was the way to it so I have the feeling really if somebody's not ready don't push him or her especially you have to have the feeling that you're ready and then it's the right time yeah that is an important note and you obviously knew it was the right time for flowers so you yes. went into, into this. That's also an interesting point for a lot of people. How had, did you have a personal connection? Did it spark you one day with this idea of a subscription model? Actually, I always had this large passion for flowers. So I always had flowers in my flat and I arranged everything really nicely. And I always had this large love for flowers. And when I was working for Rocket Internet, I bought flowers every Monday morning when I came into the office. And my boss was really always like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, yeah, because I need flowers. I want to have flowers in my life. And then I prepared them in the kitchen and then I put them on the desk of my employees and everything. And then we moved because the first company I worked at Rocket for was bought by Zalando. So I was working at Zalando and I didn't have a flower shop on the way to work anymore. And then I was like, hmm, why is there only a service online where you can order a bound bouquet that you give away as a gift, but you don't order for yourself? You don't go to the flower shop and say, oh, give me this nice bouquet for 50 euros. I put it in my, I don't know, living room, but you order cut, uh, you, you buy cut flowers. So you buy roses, you buy tulips and everything. So I saw this large demand in the offline market of fresh unbound cat flowers, but online nobody did it. So that's why I came up with the idea of Bloomy Days and um, basically the idea of doing it in the subscription was a convenience factor because I said, if I want to have fresh unbound cat flowers, I want to have them weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. And we were also the first subscription model that invented this play and pause button. So if you're on vacation, you can just pause. If you're um, there, you can uh, replay again. And what you also could have done it is to, for example, when you're on vacation, you can say, oh, please deliver them to my best friend or deliver them to my mom or something like this. It was really successful. So at the end, we were at a run rate of, I think, nearly 7 million. Um, euros in revenue so it was really really nice business um, grew fantastically and it was really sad because uh, we were not profitable and at the end that was um, the the main the main issue and um, so we couldn't really um, hold our costs so we had to um, we had to let go of the company yeah that is maybe now coming to some of the people who don't know the complete story yet coming as a surprise but basically what you mentioned in the intro was also that a uh, funding round didn't come through and for high growth companies that can mean that uh, you're not stable financially stable you can't uh, have your um, your financial runway secured so this can come to a quick soon end and I think what you also experienced was um, obviously in the media or what other people always have form an opinion this then is being seen as a failure in that sense of the, the business wasn't uh, continuing successfully 
but you always had a different take on that and you also didn't want that stamp from the from the media that they just wanted to draft the failure story. Absolutely, absolutely. Do you want to so, say yeah. <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about that because I think it's an, it was an interesting way because um, to put the story a little bit into perspective is that um, we've done 1 million more revenue than expected in 2016. And um, so we talked to our, to our shareholders and we said we need 1.5 million investment to be profitable. And um, our two largest shareholders agreed that they will both put 750K into the company because at that stage, when you're not profitable, it wouldn't really make sense to make a large financing round. Either you take it for internet internationalization or you take it for profitability, but no, you don't take it for profitability or the company is already profitable. So um, we agreed on that. So we got the first uh, 750K in Jen and it was really going well. So we were 20% ahead plan and everything. So we had scalable marketing channels, everything fine. And then our largest shareholder um, who was really also kind of my mentor and, and we had a really close relationship. Um, he, um, he got sick, he had cancer and he really passed away like within two weeks. And um, it was a family office and his family really didn't like his startup financing activation. So they uh, froze all the assets and we couldn't um, get the money anymore. So it was really dramatic and really tragic because we were really in this situation and we didn't do anything wrong. So um, I always compare it as if you're driving a car and you're going to the Autobahn, what's this? Uh, the, the, the highway. So you take a risk that something might happen because you have speed, you have other cars on the street and everything like that. But the thing is that if you're doing it in a, in a proper way and if you're really doing your best then probably nothing will happen. So it, it will, you will reach your goal and everything will be fine. So Nevertheless, it can happen that somebody else will drive into you, something happened, maybe the weather condition or something like this, but you cannot really do anything against it. So maybe you have a really bad accident, but you cannot really do something for it. That's what happened to us. On a different level, when you are drunk, when you take drugs, when you go onto the wrong entry of the railway, uh, the highway, then for sure it's a problem and i think a lot of companies fail because the people are doing some some bad things so um i think what what we really we had this super enormous accident without having a lot to do with it so i had the feeling that i want to tell this story and i want to tell the story directly because i didn't see it as a failure because the company was great the team was great what we built was great but sometimes if you're not profitable, profitable, these things happen. So um, we decided to file for insolvency and um, at a really early stage so we can really pay all our open bills and everything and nobody really gets hurt. And, um, and, the, and I published an open letter on Facebook um, and decided that I want to tell the story and I don't want any media to um, say it's this or that or this. So this was to be honest, really interesting because um, within like two days, over a hundred thousand people read this uh, open letter and I got so much incredible feedback and really like so many um, ex-employees or ex-investors or ex-partners, they wrote me and supported me. And that was really an interesting um, experience because when you really say, that's it. I'm so sorry. We couldn't do anything more. We did everything we can, but now it's like this. That's the situation. We have to deal with it now. It's really tough for us. But if you're really open and honest in all your communication, you see that nobody's really like hurting you or, or trying to push you down, but everybody wants to lift you, lift you up and give you a hand and help you back on the street. So it was really incredible to see that we got so much love and so much power um, from this situation that was a miserable situation but and that's to come back to this highway um, ex uh, example that's the thing when you don't do something like really wrong then a lot of people say okay how can I help you to get back on your feet how can I help you to to stand up and that was really um, that was really great experience 
Okay, yes. And I think that a lot of people can also resonate because as you said in your case, it was something that was out of your control almost. But even if it is maybe something that went a bit wrong or back a bit downside and it was somehow in your control, but it, failure doesn't always need to be so connotated negatively. So in this regard, you've touched Absolutely. on it. But as you, as you said before, why, why do I put it in, in another way or why do I don't want to have like this failure stamp is that this is entrepreneurship. Um, a lot of bad things happen every day. You always have to struggle. You always have to find solution. It's really, really exhausting. It's a marathon. And what I want to say is the problem is it happens and it's okay that it happens and you learn a ton out of everything that happens. But I don't want to glorify failure as something that is like a go-to habit and that is something that is really cool and everybody has to fail at some point. Because as I said, there are a lot of people that are doing things wrong and that are driving drunk and that are really like um, uh, producing accidents and not really like getting it. So that's why I always say you really have to understand the situation and failure is part of the entrepreneurial culture and, and, and structure and the whole history it, because it happens. But I think it's important to understand what lead to this and on what what do you take out of it and i think what is something that is really sad in germany that if you're not successful with one company and success is a big word because i always define the experience and not really the success at the end and when i see what an incredible experience that was those five years it's really amazing and um and what, when you see that, and not only um, the failure as itself, then I think we need to try to avoid failure. But if it happens, try to help each other out. That's maybe um, something that is really important. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's why we also believe in the power of creating. You have the greatest community, by the way. They only comment nice things. It's so <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. <laughs> going out it's really, they are also like pushing and standing on the sideline. It's awesome. <laughs> we're seeing all of you and we're seeing your comments. Thank you for being so active also. Yeah, it's um, really nice. I also Thank see you. In the Facebook group, there's lots of comments coming in. And Okay, so we're picking it up at that stage. You have lost Bloomy Days at that stage. That was 2017. Yeah. And there's a saying in German that goes, if, when man from Pferd fährt, then soll man gleich wieder aufsteigen. Yeah. When you fall from yeah. the horse, you should immediately jump back on. And that's exactly what you did because there wasn't much time until you were diving. Yeah, to be honest, um, I didn't have any other chance because I really, you have to imagine that when we have filed for insolvency, I got my second daughter um, like two weeks later and um, she was a preemie. I was three months with her in the hospital and we nearly both died and I had nothing anymore. So really I had even, I had to give away my, my phone, my laptop, my everything and I had to start from scratch so I was thinking about okay now I can ask for some Elterngeld so parenting money but I need to earn more because I need to get a laptop back I need to get a phone back and everything so right when I was out of the hospital I went into the uh, computer store and bought from my dispo, so from my credit um, on the bank account, a new laptop uh, where everybody thought I was crazy, but it was really the last money I had. And I had to, and I said, no, I have to start new. I need this now. I want to buy it for my own money. I don't want anything like uh, buy it vintage. <laughs> so um, I, I did this and then I was working for friends of mine who renovated their office and they said, now you have time, you can come and do this. And that's something I could like do with my super tiny one, two kilo daughter. Um, so I was in the office there and I, um, I had the possibility to earn some money to buy me a new phone, uh, to buy me a new, um, some things that I needed. And I did this till the end of the year to, to just get back to something because I really cannot imagine I had nothing anymore. So for sure, my husband was there thankfully so he could pay the rent but um you need to have something so i had to make a living so it was not that i 
I get anything out of um, the whole Bloomy Day story. So it was really, really tough for me. So I, um, I had my two daughters and I needed to, to build this um, new, or well, to, to build something. And then I started with um, consulting. So I consulted uh, large corporates uh, on their way to digitalization and everything. And um, what I experienced with the open letter on Facebook is that it's so much better to be the, the teller of your own story and not to um, play it uh, throughout the media because I had, as you just mentioned, also a lot of press attention and everybody wanted to do like a four or five pages portray the, fa the failed star of the Berlin startup scene and all that shit. And I always said, no, please let's talk about the story, how I feel it and I don't want to have another failure story because we don't have any female founders in this country and if you're like now doing a five pages portrait about the failure um, of all times then we won't have any more um, more female founders in this country so I don't want to do this so everybody said no we want to we want to do the failure stories so at that point Instagram invented the stories and I said, that's the best possibility for me to really reach out to a large target group and to start working on my own channel so I can push the infos that I want to push and not, I'm not demanding on any magazine. So um, in, in the beginning of 2017, I started Instagram with like 500 followers. And throughout that stage, I thought, okay, maybe it would be cool if I can explain to my followers how to build a company because everybody is so afraid and everybody don't know how to start. And then I just listen to my customers or my, my followers and they always ask me for my necklaces. And that was really the first product that we did. So it's personalized necklaces in real gold with the names of my daughters on it. So I thought, okay, maybe that's a good case. Um, I have the necklaces. I have a lot of demand for them. I explain on the example of my necklaces, how to build a company. So I said, here, you go and get a Gewerbeanmeldung in Germany, and then you do this and that, and you get a Steuernummer, and then I was, I don't know all the, the words in, in English, um, but really simple. And I said, so, and now you can, you have a company, you can start doing it. And then Etsy came to me and they asked me if we want to do a corporation. And then I had the great um, possibility that um, I just started with an Etsy shop, super easy, not really like this big vision, oh, I cannot do it anymore after Bloomy Days to start an Etsy shop. But I said, what do I have to lose? Nothing. So I really invested from the beginning on 500 euros and I didn't have anything more on my like five necklaces, went online on Etsy and on the first day, and I had like not as many followers as I have now. I had like 800 followers or something like this. We did nearly 30,000 euros in revenue. It's amazing. And I was like, okay, now really everybody I know has a necklace. Now I can close the business because everybody understood how this works. So everybody can do it now. And then it didn't stop. So um, the first year we stayed with the Etsy shop and then was really interesting because Etsy US uh, always said, who's this woman there in Germany? Why is she making so much revenue? We have to kick her out of the platform because it's not what Etsy is built for. So in May of 2019, we've created our own online shop and now we rebranded it. So it's now the Sisplis and we are producing real gold jewelry. Everything is handmade in Germany, um, only precious stones, and it's amazing, and the business is growing so fast, and it's 100% mine, and I can make all the decisions, and I can call the shots, and it's highly profitable, and I'm so happy, and this is what this crazy journey um, brought me to. Wow. That is a, an amazing <laughs> journey. And also it started with, as you said, 500 euros and Etsy and your 800 followers. And now you have this amazing community that's highly engaged also that is, I think, in a feedback loop with you, constantly giving you feedback on products, but also yeah. you're talking to them, you're sharing your whole story with them. And not to lose sight of the whole thing, you're doing all of this while also having a family, having your very newborn or very small still daughter and doing this kind of the second time around. In between, you also squeezed in the consulting company. So here is what a lot of, I saw we had some comments also, um, also Berlin-based mom entrepreneur earlier. So what's, the, what's your secret in this whole mix of getting this all done and having the family? Where a lot of people might say, this is a lot. 
It's definitely a lot. And it's always a struggle. And I have to be honest, the first two years were really crazy because my husband also founded a company. He's doing marketing consultancy. And um, so I really had to get up off my, uh, on my feet. At the first year, I really took care of my baby daughter alone. And I always took like every second I had when she was sleeping or still building the company. And um, I had to pick up my older daughter at four from the kindergarten. So it was really a struggle between everything. And after like the first two years, I was really exhausted. And um, that's the honest thing. So I was really never one day only sitting in a cafe having a latte macchiato chatting with my friends and enjoying this baby break that's the honest truth so you really have to want it you really have to work hard but at the end when i now see what is possible if you're willing to invest everything and that's also financially because really the first two years i I took, I put every, I reinvested like everything we've earned into new products, into the website, into everything. So I really had always like 20K on the bank account down to zero, 20K down to zero, 20K down to zero. So at the end, you always have to be willing to take the risk to lose everything again and to start from scratch and, and again. And maybe that was the biggest for me success factor or the biggest um, thing that I had out, out of this whole Bloomy Day story that I'm not afraid to fail anymore. So I'm, I, I, there's this saying, I think, from Sheryl Sandberg that she always said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And I'm not afraid anymore. I'm not afraid of anything. And I know what I want and I know what I can and I know that I can, can do it. So um, also in this kind of struggle with family and building a business and everything, it's really interesting that you ask because right now I'm at the same place. We grew a thousand six hundred percent over the last months it's insane and we're like two um full-time employee people or more 30 hours and uh, like five um freelancers it's insane uh, what we've built and where we are going and what's the right decision because to be honest we love it that way and we we love it that it's small we love it that we can do everything by ourselves and that we're so flexible and that we can really decide from day to day how we want to grow so for me it's really over the last two years um or the last year i had like the perfect scenario because i was really um i had a company I um, I could prove that I can build brands. That was really important for me because <laughs> Bloomy Days was a really strong brand and I always wanted to not be a one-hit wonder. And um, so I wanted to show that I can really build brands uh, several times. And I had a lot of time with my kids. So I really could like go every afternoon and spend time with them and see them grow and everything. So I didn't, I'm not the one that is saying like, I want to work 90 hours per week and I don't care about the family. So I always try to really combine it. And, and now it's really exactly that, that I see, to be honest, it's, it's the revenue is the same in the gross factors that we had with Bloomy Days. So from this perspective, at this stage, I already had 2.5 million in the company in Bloomy Days times, and I already had like 30, 40 employees. So what are we going to do now? What, how can we build the model? Um, how do I want to live? How, how much time do I want to spend um, in the company? How much time do I, spend to, uh, to, I like to spend on the playground? So that's what we're balancing out right now and to find a good combination. And the the largest success for me is that I can decide it. And I really have to always put it back in my mantra and I always have to, to be honest to myself that I can really decide it now because there are no stakeholders. There's nobody who's telling me anything. So I can really decide how I want to do it. And now I have to self-discipline myself to really do it and to really, um, to really get a feeling how I want to live my life. And that's not so easy as a question because I always said, yeah, there's so many people telling me what to do and not to do. And I'm like, oh shit, yeah, I'm the only one doing me this pressure. I'm the only one like growing the company like crazy. So let's see, sit back and what do I really want? And to be honest, I, I love it, um, how it's growing slowly, organically and how we did it um, over the last two years. Yeah, you did, you did an amazing another amazing success story and you say slowly but it actually is quite <laughs> an impressive growth and if you also now say 
you had these two different approaches, right? You had a very high, strong growth company at first that was financially financed um, by some investors. And then you did it all yourself, bootstrapped with just investing what you made and then going to the next growth phase organically, so to say. And I think the important thing to sum up where it also ties in your family and everything is that you said in the beginning, it's so much hard work, but now you are almost at a stage where you can decide and give yourself yeah. a bit of freedom that you probably wouldn't have if you would be in an employed, um, in an employed stage right now or still Absolutely. at a very early stage. Yeah, absolutely. And this is really what I also see. That's also a learning from Lumi days. I had so many administrative ad, uh, admin stuff that I had to do, like uh, with all the employees and everything. So I nearly didn't had any time um, to really work on the growth of the company, on the vision, on new ideas and everything. And I think that's what I'm really, really good at. And to do this, I really need some free time, like going around, I find inspiration in so many things. Traveling is really hard for me that I cannot travel right now. So, um, but that's also something that I really like and enjoy. And that's something I really see that I'm as the best when I feel free. And um, I don't have to, I cannot have the feeling that I have to be here like 12 hours and um, I didn't get anything done because I have like meetings all the day. So that's also, for example, where one has to be really honest with um, oneself because I think also in Corona times, we only had this enormous growth because I had nothing on my calendar. I had no phones, no meetings, no nothing. And I could really focus like six or eight hours per day working on the growth of the company and it paid off and that's something that is also really interesting um that you really always set yourself a little bit more free to work on this and not to put too much admin stuff on your calendar because mostly ceos are the visionaries and not so much the organizers and i was i was stuck with too many organizing things at the end of bloomy Death, definitely yeah okay that can be and also sorry really interesting also in comparison to, uh, between the companies with bloomy days the first thing i did was this crowdfunding so um we i decided if i want to build a company i have to have investors i have to uh, go for the big money and everything so we did a crowdfunding campaign which was enormously successful so we had like i think 100,000 euros in 93 minutes and then afterwards we had in total i guess around 5 million in the company and 80% of my job was investor relations and doing reportings and um, explaining and meeting new investors and everything. So you're stuck with all that so much that you cannot really focus on growing the business. So that's something that is here now with the SysBliss completely different because I can really only focus on growing the business, doing new products, doing this, doing that. And for me, it's so much more fulfilling to make revenue instead of getting external funding. So I never felt so good um, after one financing round than as I feel now when we, do, when we see we had a great day. And I'm like, yes, uh, that's, that's really awesome. So I really love to make revenue, to invest in new products, invest in the company. And that's what makes me happy. So one really always have to, to challenge uh, oneself What's the aim? What makes you happy? And for me, revenue strives me because I'm happy to have money to invest it and to do great more things with it and not really to, to get the money to, to play with it. Yeah, no, very much so. I see a lot of comments coming in that some of our community members also are a bit stifled by actually the, all the admin that they have to do, all the things that they're trying to put on their plates because we're kind of a one-man show a lot of the times in the beginning. Um, but I also see that we have a lot of questions here in the Q&A box. And one other thing that I would really uh, ask before we take some, some questions from the community is if you are not following you on Instagram yet, I would really highly recommend you follow Francie because she sa shares so much valuable insight. Yeah, maybe we have to say it's at Sissy Hardenberg. Maybe we at can Sissy write it later in the com comments because some yeah, asked already. Maybe. A link it would be, please all follow me then we maybe can we crack together the 30,000 that would be awesome and only the half of you watching now have to follow me and then I would be so thrilled would be awesome thank you so, <laughs> you heard it guys please also 
also jump on it. Um, once we also create the page for this, it will also link to all your pages. Thank you. People can, but you find definitely at CC Hardenberg on Instagram, where she shares a lot about all the aspects of the story. So really, really highly recommend. Everyone in the chat is going crazy saying that they already follow you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but so that actually brings me to the really, this yeah, is very sorry. interesting. You've built this amazing engaged community. They're highly engaged. I've seen under your post, there's so much, much more going on under some other people that I follow. There's so many more, more engaged people, more interactive comments. People are just giving so much of themselves also because you give so much of yourself. So I think my, and it comes so natural to you and you've been, as you stated, you've been doing it since 2017. So my question would be, there's a lot of founders I noticed from our founders club and from just also friends is they are not willing to give their own personal brand this space and they don't, they feel shy about going on camera or also sharing more of this. What would be your advice for business growth and also for putting your business out there if you are not so comfortable to sharing all of the story, very open, very transparent and very honest with everyone. Yeah, don't do it. That would be my advice. So I really think the, the key success factor is why I'm so successful at Instagram or with the business is that I'm 100% authentic. So for me, really always the greatest compliment is that when people meet me in real life for the first time, they always say, it's crazy. It's really, there's no difference between you on Insta and seeing you here. And it's really, it's 100% same. And I'm not telling a story. I'm not uh, creating a personal brand. I am just telling the people what I do. So I think that's maybe the, the success factor. And if people don't feel comfortable in front of a camera, please don't do it. So um, I would really recommend to look for other um, platforms, for other social media channels where you don't have to use this because on Instagram stories is really relevant right now. So you cannot really grow over the feed anymore. So you really have to have to be strong at stories and storytelling. And for me, that's so easy because I see a story in nearly everything. And I really love the storytelling. I love the content creation and everything. So for me, it's really the, the best advice is find your channel. So for example, what I can really recommend because it's an it's, it's really fastly growing right now is LinkedIn. So maybe you're really good at writing and maybe you can um, sh show there some insightful and interesting insights um, throughout your entrepreneurial um, journey or you have maybe some interesting interviews that you can share or something. So um, if you're not willing to, um, to go in front of camera, I would go for example, um, right now to LinkedIn, there's really a large potential for growth. There are a lot of uh, customers that are also interested in this. And within a short time, you can really gain a, a lot of reach. And um, that's, that's probably the advice I could give. So the only thing that I would not recommend is like pushing yourself to go in front of a camera if you don't like it, because the people will always see that it's not authentic. Yeah, okay, that is great. So I also can second that LinkedIn is emerging and there's a bit of different sharing. Also, they have stories now. I don't know how this will do in the future. Ah, so okay, interesting. There is <laughs> ways of different sharing, but also blogging, writing yeah. articles, commenting and starting discussion threads on, on LinkedIn. Um, so definitely other ways, but thank you for sharing that other approach. I'm going to take some of our uh, members' questions for you, if that's all right. One second, the phone is ringing. Customers yeah. always Thank first. <laughs> Thank you all for being so active in the chat and for following uh, Francie. I see a lot of you have followed her. So that would be amazing. Sorry. Help her on her way to the next Instagram follow goal. Um, so I have a couple of questions here. And um, they, some of them are quite similar. So I'm going to try to uh, put them together in one question. We had one question here. Um, so this is quite uh, specific to, to commerce. And this is the question if how long in the beginning, and this was probably then your Etsy or when you launched, when you moved over to your online site, how long did it take you to see uh, traffic there? Was it immediate? Did you just launch and you just prepared the launch really well and then the traffic came? To be honest, I'm doing no analytics at all it's really bad there's not one excel sheet in this company it's insane i know but it's really i'm doing this all out of and I, I know how much revenue we want to do on one day and i know if i have to push it more if i if it's enough but 
as I said, that's the healing from bloomy days. We were always like having this large dashboards and everything came in and then we have to make this and that a revenue. But to be honest, it was like the first two years I was completely alone with like two freelancers and I had a really low cost structure. So it did really matter how much revenue for me, for example, it's so much more important, not the revenue that we do per day, but the orders we have, because I say for me, it's more important to grow the orders instead of the revenue because a customer, for example, this is like one of our best sellers. It's just these bracelets, empowerment bracelets that we have with different kind of quotes on it. And a customer that buys the bracelets can buy tomorrow a ring for 5,000 euros. So it's, it's not, it doesn't matter to me if, um, if the, the volume is high or low and, um, the traffic also really depends. And, um, for me, it's not so important and I don't really measure it. So I really don't, um, don't look so much on the traffic or anything because we're not going it um, so so analytically. What we are now doing, and I think that's really important, um, the whole growth um, that we had so far um, is all depending on my Instagram. So we didn't spend one euro for marketing. It's all through my followers and through recommendations. We have a repurchasing rate of 40%. So 40% of our customers have more than one piece of us already. So it's incredible because the quality is insane, really. And that's something that helped us grow. So mouth to mouth and um, Instagram. So what we're now doing is like setting up more um, online marketing channels to have a more sustainable growth and then we will surely have a look at the traffic and everything but be because we didn't really um, set it up earlier it didn't really make sense because I don't really care if we have like two um, people on the website if it's the right two and they like um, want to shop some jewelry it's perfect and um, I don't need 10 so um, that's that's basically the honest answer to that yeah wow this is uh, i saw in the chat also such a refreshing unorthodox <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it's a little bit it. embarrassing too but really i'm i'm so product driven i'm so customer driven i don't have time to crack the acne sheets every day it's it's really it's um yeah it holds me back and it's not really i always want to push the company forward and not backward analyzing yeah, definitely. I want to get to one or two more questions. So we have one, sure. uh, quite an overarching one, but what's your number one tip for any one woman show building a brand before the launch? I mean, first of all, the number one tip is to speak about what you're planning to do. Um, I think that's something a lot of people and especially women are always afraid that somebody would steal the idea or so. And I think it's so important to really challenge the idea with different kinds of people. So um, I always have the feeling when I talk to people about my visions, what I want to do, what I plan, there's always so much powerful um, advice they give me. And it's so interesting to really challenge those ideas. And that would be something I would definitely do because everything brings you so much further and you are so far in your whole process of building this company nobody even if they take only this split of idea and try to do it themselves will be at that point where you are so my number one advice would be don't be afraid to share don't be afraid to challenge your idea don't be afraid to to earn some feedback because that's the best thing you can do and um that's the number one and second is to be honest, um, look for a product that is, um, best of all, acid lean. So we really don't have any stock. Everything is made to order. So I didn't have to have a large investment because we only invest in the samples, and but we don't invest in large stock. So it's really acid lean. So if I have to close tomorrow, for whatever reason, I have a really nice stock of um, the be most beautiful uh, diamond jewelry samples and my, my daughters will be really happy, but I don't have any loss. So it's that's um, something that I can really recommend. Look for something that is asset lean on demand production and so. So you don't really have to have a large investment in the beginning. Mm, and look for something with a more higher um, basket value. So that is also something I can make so much faster growth, revenue, everything, because I have to sell so less, so much less than with Bloomy Days. And for example, as I just said before, we have the same 
revenue um, growth um, that was Bloomy Days because we had a product for like 19 euro 90 and it was fresh unbound cut flowers delivered to your door, including delivery, everything for 20 euros. So at the last Mother's Day in 2017, we sold 10,000 bouquets of flowers, which is incredible. Um, but at the end, the revenue is not so much and the profitability is also not so much and we needed like 200 people working three days in three time shifts to get this shit done to be honest and that was so operationally heavy what we can now do and invest in packaging invest in customer experience invest in so much more and we have so much more flexibility so as as a one uh, what yeah as a as a founder and you're alone, I would really um, look into these details. Okay. Yeah, that was also a very valuable answer that had so many different points that you can really bear in mind if you're starting, especially if you're also starting commerce. And um, I feel we could talk for ages, but I'm also aware of our time and uh, of our next session starting soon. So I do, I know there's a lot of questions and um, they also join our Facebook group. There will be even more. So maybe at a later stage, we can get to all of these again. That would be very lovely. But for now, thank you so much, Francie, for sharing all of this and for giving thank you so much for the invitation you do on your Instagram. We're hoping that with this summit and with everything you've now shared, we can kickstart your Instagram yeah. <laughs> with everyone. Um, really, thank you so much for your time and for thank your Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, thank you. And have a good summit. Yes, we will. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much.